Hey, good afternoon. I don't see my light. Good afternoon and welcome to today's episode of Challenges in the Street. Uh, Battalion Chief Davis here, as usual, if you are a chief, uh, certified chief officer uh, in wishing to get COPDI credit, then we need you to uh, sign in now. Sorry, I was trying to figure out what camera to look at. We're good now. Sorry about that. Anyway, if you're, you're a certified chief officer wishing a COPDI credit, make sure you sign in now with your name in the chat and your fire service ID, and then again at the end. I uh, want to talk about a couple things that came up from a few episodes ago. Actually, one thing that's come up in a couple episodes. You don't mind throwing that ladder truck photo up for me. So we've had a few episodes, mainly a boss talk, maybe of a, uh, another topic, uh, where we talk about crews breaking up, operating independently, right? We really don't like that. That's not really part of uh, how our IRP works. But in a way, we kind of set ourselves up for that. And I was thinking about it some, and really, when I see the tiller truck, I think of that, right? We're running three-person staffing on that tiller truck, and it is very easy for that officer and that tiller person they get separated, either because they're not dressed or it's a different type of call or it's coming back from a different run. So the message here is uh, we really don't want people working independently by themselves, right? That's not how uh, any of our structural fire attack operates. Uh, people work together as pairs or as teams. We understand, hey, in a search situation, maybe somebody's at the door while you search the room, all of that kind of thing. This is probably most important for our ladder companies where you're operating with a three-person rig and especially those tiller companies because that sets you up to be separated early on. So the message to the officers, don't separate yourselves, right? Or if you do, you have to have a really good defendable reason why that happened. And for our firefighters in that uh, T7 or T3 position, right, your job is to be ready to go to work with your officer. So enough said about that. That also pops up in the uh, engine company when we're down staff because of a medic upgrading, three-person engine company. Anyway, <clears throat> I want to move on to today, right? So keep that in mind. A lot of good stuff today about EMS uh, quality management, right? So there are more than a million people in Montgomery County. So just think of the, the calls for service that generates let alone in the fire department, think about the police, you listen to the police radio, right? They go to probably an extra 100,000 plus calls than we do. We see a lot of people. Some of these people we see way more frequent than others. Uh, at the end of the day, we take a lot of people to the hospital. Uh, we have a lot of involvement with a wide variety of patients, and we also have a wide uh, variety of facilities and locations that they come from. One of the most important things we do as an organization is to have oversight, some quality oversight of uh, those processes, uh, our providers, and so forth. We're, we really are the gold standard in a lot of what we do in the state of Maryland. Uh, some of this is codified, meaning that state law requires us to do these things. Uh, in some cases, right, there is uh, a bit of a mystery behind that. So today, we're trying to take a peek behind the curtain at what happens in the EMS division as they manage uh, quality assurance and quality improvement. So really glad to have folks from the EMS group here today to speak with us about that. And I'm just going to get started and hand it off to Battalion Chief Tim Burns uh, as our lead presenter. Chief? Thanks. Uh, like Chief Davis said, uh, I'm Chief Tim Burns, and this is uh, Captain Nick Wagner, our Quality Improvement Officer. I'm also joined by Firefighter Josh Cook, who is a one of our process owners for one of the processes, and we'll get into w exactly what that means and what he does. And also, uh, we have uh, Captain Brady Miller joining us on the panel today, who's really a plant from the firefighters because they can't have a bunch of EMS guys up here with no representation. Yeah. So... Um, Getting started, uh, we're going to talk about quality management. So uh, just to keep in mind, so EMS quality management, uh, 
encompasses a bunch of different things uh, and a bunch of different processes within EMS administration, uh, two of the biggest being uh, EMS quality improvement and EMS quality assurance. But uh, recently, I was added, or a position, a battalion chief position was added to the EMS section uh, that was slated to, to be funded at the end of FY23, so a year from now. That funding was moved up. Uh, to the beginning of the fiscal year. So this is sort of what the EMS section looks like now with the uh, section chief, assistant chief Ogren, and then two battalion chiefs. So there's battalion chief Kaufman and I who, uh, who oversee the, the administrative functions of uh, the section. Uh, he, uh, he's in charge of operations. So that includes uh, both of the current duty officers the new third EMS duty officer in the field, and then EMS 700 uh, when it comes up online. On my side of the house, I have the EMS Quality Assurance Office, uh, the Quality Improvement Office. Under the Quality Improvement Office, we have the field level process owners. And then reporting to Chief Ogren, we have the Office of Medical Oversight, uh, uh, an OSC, uh, who many of you have not met yet, uh, Kristen Dos Santos, and then the whole mobile integrated health section, which we're not going to talk about today. And then uh, within my uh, realm, we also have the documentation completion section, and many of you have received messages from firefighter Megan Harrell, who uh, sort of manages that and sends out uh, friendly reminders and keeps folks on track. Uh, with regards to getting their reports just completed, uh, getting all the fields done and everything. As far as responsibilities, like I said, Chief Kaufman does operations, so he, he oversees the daily operations. Uh, the hospital interface is, the big, is one big thing that he does, so he deals with all of uh, all the hospital administrators. When we get units stuck at hospitals, the daily uh, actions that the EMS studio officers are taking, putting uh, the county on and off of blue, hospitals going on and off of reroute, he oversees all of that. He's also the fleet liaison, so you can blame him for all the new ambulances that come in when you don't like them. Uh, and then he's also the liaison to EMS logistics. So, you know, what kind of equipment we purchase, he weighs in on that, uh, you know, inventories, things like that. Uh, I oversee QA and QI. I work on uh, or will be working on things like policy development, protocol writing at the state level. Um, uh, one big thing that we do that's not really well known is uh, we call it expansion of the body of knowledge. So whether that's knowledge of the EMS system internally uh, through data analysis and knowing what our performance is, performance monitoring and performance measurement, um, but also proving value for the things that you folks do. Uh, and then we also do publish uh, articles in the national literature. We have a bunch of different uh, abstracts and full-length articles that have either been published or are in the process of, of being published. So we, we like to share the good work that you do and the knowledge that we learn here in Montgomery County with uh, other places around the country. Uh, together, sort of there's uh, overlap. Um, so anything that deals with innovation, whether it's new processes, new medications, um, new equipment, uh, we sort of both collaborate on that. We both have dealings with MIMS. Um, Chief Kaufman from an operational perspective, me for more from an administrative side. Uh, and then there are other stakeholders that we both sort of deal with and communicate with, uh, the jails, the schools, all of those other things, that, all of those other people that we collaborate with as the EMS section that sort of both of us take care of. But that's going to be probably, you know, this is all very new, but this is how things are going to look going forward with two battalion chiefs in there. Um, but the, we've grown so much and we've added positions and the span of control really got a little bit too much for one battalion chief to oversee. So we were very fortunate enough this fiscal year to uh, get these enhan enhancements. Um, specific to QA, uh, the QA officer with the promotion of uh, now Battalion Chief Tony Scott, the QA officer spot is currently vacant. Um, we're working on getting that filled, but congratulations to Chief Scott who went to Battalion 4A. Uh, right now we are sort of limping along, but doing very well with two assistant QA officers, uh, Captain Todd DeMent and Captain Jeff Kane. Um, who are stepping up and filling those roles. We also have a small number of volunteers who assist us with, um, with uh, QA-related work at the volunteer level. Um, 
so there are a couple of folks that help us out at Burnsville, a couple of folks that help us out at um, at BCC, uh, and that's very very helpful to us because sometimes our schedules don't mesh with the uh, with the volunteers, or um, they're just more comfortable receiving feedback from folks within their corporation. And we're very fortunate enough to have that partnership with those folks from the volunteer corporations. All right, so. Overall, the goal of quality management and the goal of the EMS leadership within the section is to provide you with what you need to be successful, um, whether that's knowledge, equipment, um, uh, skills, techniques, whatever it is, you know, we ultimately, at the end of the day, we want you to be successful in taking care of the patients. So keep that in mind as we're talking about all these things. But here's the caveat to that. Who defines what's successful? Right. Uh, sometimes when we when we approach folks with an issue, their first uh, reaction is to either get defensive or not uh, respond in the way we would expect, and that's because they're defining success from their perspective. Right. What I feel like I should do for the patient, or uh, what I feel like I want to do for the patient, uh, and that's not always the way that we're looking at it. So first and foremost, we're defining success in what you do from the patient's perspective. Did you give the patient what they needed when they needed it? From a medical perspective, uh, we need Dr. Stone's buy-in to that as to what a successful patient interaction looks like. The organization, right, there are, there are policies and procedures that we have to live within. And then there are other things like the Maryland Medical Protocol um, and then the uh, body of evidence that exists around EMS medicine, right? So, you know, uh, a couple of years ago or several years ago, the standard of care for cardiac arrest was to throw the patient in the unit and get him to the hospital real fast. And as the evidence and the literature evolved, we realized that that wasn't the best thing for the patient or the best medicine to deliver to the patient. And as that evolved, we had to change what people what people's perception or what people's idea of good patient care was. No longer was it, hey, take this cardiac arrest and move them really fast. Um, now, a successful patient interaction for cardiac arrest is uh, a resuscitation, an on dedicated on-scene resuscitation um, f up until the point when, you're, uh, uh, when the protocol says you can move them, which is based on the science and the literature. So, EMS quality assurance only deals with the medicine, and that's one big point that we'd like to get across today. So we don't care if you wore your seatbelt while you were driving to the call. Um, we don't care if you showed up late to work this morning. We don't care about any of that conduct or behavior stuff. Um, we care about the medicine. Was the medicine appropriate? Was it up to the latest standards? Was it within the protocol? Those are all the questions that we're trying to ask. And things outside of that, we really have no purview. We seek to identify significant gaps in medical knowledge and correct them. So at the end, you know, ultimately it's about education, a lot of what we do. Um, we're just trying to close the knowledge gap. When we get a concern, any QA concern, and these things are all defined in the, in the quality management policy, uh, the first step in the QA process is, is a concern. So somebody comes to us, and the, the concerns can come from any number of different places. Um, but when it's a quality assurance concern, somebody says, hey, I, I had a, an issue with X that happened on a, on a call, or I did Y on a call, was that the right thing, right? So is there a nexus to medicine? Does it rise to a level that we would need to address? Because we can't be, uh, we can't, I'll, I'll get into that in a second. Uh, is it a system issue or an individual issue? And what's the knowledge gap that we're trying to close? So nexus to medicine. Like I said, conduct issues belong to the chain of the command. The, the medicine belongs to us. But sometimes one issue straddles both tracks. If you're mean to a little old lady who's having chest pain, there are conduct and medical implications to that behavior. And sometimes one specific incident will follow both tracks where the conduct will be addressed by the chain of command and the medicine will be addressed by EMS quality assurance. So you might get 
a conversation, a phone call, or an email that says, hey, uh, this is how you were perceived by this patient. Uh, they were having chest pain, and we want you to know that, you know, the medical reason why you need to not make the patient angry or not upset the patient is because you can make their medical con condition worse, and this is why. And, and we might explain it to you from a medical perspective, and you still may have questions to answer with your chain of command as to why you weren't nice. Um, but that's a little bit nuanced. Those cases, uh, they're not very frequent where they, they have to take both tracks, but they do happen. All right, is it significant? We're, very, we're a, big, a big system. We're one of the largest, if not the largest, in the state of Maryland. We have 430 paramedics. Uh, that's, uh, I'm sorry, 400, that's a typo, 440 paramedics, uh, 430 career, 330 career, 110 volunteer. We ran that numbers this morning. Um, lots and lots of EMTs, more than 120,000 calls for service per year. We do about 75,000 transports per year. We cover 500 square miles and 1.1 million people. For all of that, we have one full-time EMS QA officer when it gets filled, plus a few assistants. So we have to pick and choose our battle. There's a lot of battles. There's a lot of triage that goes, goes on, and we can't be chasing every person around f that missed an aspirin to a patient who might have been having cardiac chest pain or acute coronary syndrome, right? We just can't do it. So there is a lot of triage, right? Is this a big deal? Is it not? Um, and we really try and focus on things that, ha that are impactful. So, so lapses in, in patient care that were impactful to the patient or could have been impactful to the patient um, on, on a grand scale. Uh, not consulting for, uh, you know, a, a medication when it, when it said to in the protocol, probably not as big of a deal as moving a patient right away who then ultimately coded, right? The, the moving the patient and failure to, to uh, engage a patient early that then results in cardiac arrest, very impactful to the patient. Not doing a consult and giving a medication where it's said to in the protocol, we don't have time to deal with all of those. So is it, uh, is it an individual versus a system problem, right? How long does it take to change the world one person at a time? If I know that, um, if, if I'm seeing a bunch of, of issues that are all the same in the QA office, it doesn't make sense to try and have the same conversation with 10 people about the same issue, right? Because then I'm trying to fix a problem that probably 430 paramedics have or a knowledge gap that 430 paramedics have, and I'm trying to fix that one person at a time. So those things get kicked over to quality improvement, which Captain Wagner will talk about here shortly. Um, but uh, if, if the issue, if, we've, if we started at the system level and tried to address that and through things like podcasts and, um, and the five-minute drills, right, those are big issues that we've seen across the system that we're trying to address at a, at a system-wide level. Um, when it gets down, when we've done all those things and now we've just got like three or four people who are making one mistake um, and we can have, we can feasibly have an an individual conversation with them, then we will try and address those at an individual level. Identifying the knowledge gap allows us to, to develop a remediation plan. So we really need to know what it is we're trying to, what, what was the, we'll look at a report, we'll see something happened, and we'll try and identify, all right, what didn't that they know that they should have that resulted in whatever we're seeing, uh, whatever the lapse in the, in the care was. Um, and that's what we'll try and remediate. So if we get to a point where, so we'll, we'll take that, that patient who crashes on you, you know, you, you find a, a patient who is acutely ill and you move them too fast without delivering treatment at the patient's side, right? So there we need to teach you, all right, um, I, I can come to you and I can say, all right, treat your patient before you move them. Right, and, and that's it, and that would be identifying, or that would be addressing what we saw in the report, but I need you to understand why, and that's what this identifying the knowledge gap is about. I need you to understand what's going on with the patient when you see them like that, 
why it's important that you treat them now versus later, why it's more important to treat them before they arrest than after they arrest. So it becomes more of a holistic uh, approach to uh, remediating the problem than just saying, don't do that anymore. So current QA activity, uh, Chief, Battalion Chief Scott was doing an excellent job before he got promoted. Um, year to date, uh, we've had 100, and, as of July 1st, we had 196 simple cases and four complex. It's a, a tremendous amount of work um, that, that he was doing. That's a lot of feedback being provided to folks. Uh, this is the QA process is governed by the EMS Quality Management Plan. That's uh, 21-04 AM for those of you playing along at home. Um, and that satisfies the requirement of something called Comar Title 30, which is, says that we have to have a quality management plan. It, it actually says we have to have a quality assurance plan. Uh, ours covers more than that. Um, but when MIMS asks us to see our quality, quality assurance plan, this is what we give them. Uh, it's available on Quick Links uh, for anyone to see, so there really isn't any mystery behind it. It's a completely transparent process. Uh, and especially when we get into complex cases, we will pull that out and follow it to the letter. All right, uh, talking about sources of concerns. So these are all the different places we get, uh, we get cases into the office. Um, so we get what uh, a lot of people hear about First Watch, they don't really know what it is. First Watch uh, is a private company that we have a contract with. Um, they analyze, they get streams of data. So they get every uh, a stream of data from CAD, they get a stream of data from our patient care reporting system. Um, off those two different things, they analyze every record that comes through, and we tell it what we want to know about. So we, or we tell them what we want to know about. So when you answer that question, uh, was the patient resuscitated, or did the, was there a cardiac arrest at any time during the event, and you answer yes, that sends the that triggers first watch to send the report to a group of people. Uh, traumas that don't go to suburban, right? So if if you made it a category A trauma and the destination wasn't suburban, it sends an alert, and uh, all of these reports get read. Not because we're trying to catch anybody, but you know we want to see what's going on out there. And and oftentimes when we see something, these are high consequence events, um, and we make sure that everything uh, went went according to the way it was supposed to go. We also have some other ones, you know, uh, high, high LAM scores to non-thrombectomy capable centers. Uh, we had that one put in when the new protocol came out because we wanted to sort of be able to follow up with folks who maybe didn't get the message when it came out. Uh, the EMS rekindle trigger, so that's the same patient twice within 24 hours when the first was a refusal. Um, all these different things, these data streams, uh, helps us to weed out, because we can't read every, every report. They, uh, it helps us to, to filter out what we might be interested in and allows us to, uh, to focus in on, on certain reports. We also get uh, some self-reports. So I read one this morning from a, a provider who emailed uh, the QA officer, uh, the former QA officer, and says, hey, I, I gave uh, this much medicine when I should have given this much medicine. And, you know, those are the easy ones because the provider's already self-remediated, and, and uh, we just say, yep, you know, don't do that again. Uh, we get some from hospital staff. There's a JOT form that they can fill out or they call the EMS duty officer. Sometimes there are other field clinicians who, who bring up cases. Uh, the process owners, as they're going through their data collection and reading reports, they may forward stuff over to the QA office. Uh, we sometimes get, get things from billing where the reports are incomplete or, or uh, other issues. And then the other one is the customer satisfaction survey. So every patient that we transport the next day, they get a text message survey. A lot of you have gotten the positive comments via email from me, um, but we also get concerns. Those get peeled off the top and addressed individually. And I will say that it's probably eight or nine to one positive versus negative. Um, so for every, every one uh, concern that we get generated from the customer satisfaction surveys, we probably get eight or nine positive comments back and many more positive surveys who don't fill out the text comments. 
There are two types of cases, right? Complex and simple. Uh, com complex involves any of those, uh, prohibited conduct, danger to the public, all those things. Th those are uh, a little bit more involved in nature, a little bit more serious. The simple ones are just the feedback loops, right? We might ask for some clarification and say, hey, this is what we want you to know going forward. Uh, they're very quick, very easy, um, and should be rather painless. Uh, how does the process go? We get the uh, QA concern in, in, it gets triaged by either the QAO or one of the BCs, and they, and they, need, they determine whether it needs to become an inquiry. Like I said, not everything becomes an official inquiry where it gets put in the database and logged. Some of it, we just say, no, we're not worried about that. Uh, it gets a classification as to whether it's simple or complex, and then um, they do some fact-finding, which will involve reaching out to folks and saying, hey, can you tell me what happened? Um, from there, from there, it's going to you know go through the all right fact finding and then uh, identify all those things we talked about identifying the knowledge gap. What's the remediation plan exactly? How how um, how involved will this remediation be? Uh, and then just delivering that information to the folks. Uh, some people want to know when when do we start the QA process? Uh, well. Um, any of those situations, but if you're in doubt, just reach out to somebody um, and they'll let you know. The worst thing that happens is we say, yeah, that's, that's fine, it's, it's not a big deal and, and we're not interested in picking it up. Um, but with that, I'll turn it over to Captain Wagner who's gonna talk a little bit about quality improvement and process owners. Thanks, Chief. Good afternoon, everybody. I just wanna start out by saying uh, thank you Thank you guys for doing good work. Thank you guys for, for working hard. I think uh, in my tenure here in Montgomery County, things have really changed. Um, they've definitely changed in the, the current operational environment, uh, especially in EMS. We have long wait times. We have high call volumes. Uh, we're working and interacting with uh, stress staff at, at the hospitals and, and a lot of mental health issues out in the community. So I just want to say uh, do good work. Um, but with that, there's, there's always room for improvement. And that's kind of my realm. So what is quality improvement? Quality improvement is the combined and unceasing effort of everyone to make the changes that will lead to better patient outcomes, better system, system performance, and better professional development. So Chief uh, hit on some of those things uh, earlier. He talked about education. We talked about patients. Uh, everything that we do should be, should be uh, patient-centric. Um, so. We work in a very robust and very large system. I often compare it to the Titanic of, of a fire-based EMS system. Uh, we have over 400 paramedics, 1,800 EMTs, a lot of career, and a lot of volunteer EMTs and paramedics. And we also have emergency medical dispatchers. So when we talk about quality, we start at, at the, the, the origin of it all, and that's the 911 call. So um, there's quality uh, improvement and assurance that goes on at the 911 center, and it just follows the, the chain of survival, uh, if you will. So what does this really mean? The reality, and this is the reality, all of us are highly trained and skilled professionals in pre-hospital EMS medicine, cross-trained in a fire-based EMS system. We really should take a lot of pride in that. Uh, we are a very large organization that does, does very well. So over the course of uh, my time in quality, uh, the Quality Improvement Office, I've been uh, introduced to and learning about the uh, national metrics that we, we apply to. Um, for instance, um, first medical contact to EKG time is 10 minutes. So when we arrive on scene and we hit on scene time, to the time we get a 12 lead on, the expectation from a national standard is, is 10 minutes, and, and we do pretty good at that obt uh, obtaining that. So there's definitely uh, a lot of pride, um, but a lot of things that go on behind the curtains that I wasn't privy to. Um, and the more you learn, the more you uh, can really take ownership of that. So what are we? We are healthcare professionals practicing in a rapid growing and evolving world of EMS. Um, based upon best practices of a growing body of evidence in the discipline of EMS. So we are healthcare professionals. Um, our reports do go to uh, other, other healthcare professionals, i.e. nurses, doctors, and other, uh, other healthcare professionals in the continu continuum of care. 
Um, we are always tracking uh, the, the evolving science behind medicine and uh, EMS. So it's, it's changing fast. Uh, Chief Burns and I were having a conversation this morning that it was, um, you know, 20 years ago when you got trained in, in paramedic school, not a lot changed. You know, it's, some things changed, equipment came and went, but things didn't evolve at the speed that they're evolving in now. So there's, there's definitely a, a challenge to keeping up on everything that's occurring. And Montgomery County being uh, on the progressive side of that, being on the forefront of a lot of this stuff, we're changing at a, a faster pace um, than a lot of people. So it is 2022. Our patient care records, information, and data that we obtain as an organization is linked to a lot of shared stakeholders. Uh, healthcare partners, local, state, and national uh, databases, records, um, and stakeholders are are uh, involved in, in the information. So it's, it's so imperative that when you go out there, uh, you provide an, an accurate on-scene time. Um, when you actually get to the patient side, you document a, an accurate uh, at patient care, at patient side time. When you clear the hospital, you know, it, it's, it's very, we need a lot of accurate information and that all uh, starts uh, with you. So the quality service you provide really does matter on a scale much larger than the calls that you are on on a daily basis. Um, again, we, we are a big organization, but so much goes on behind the curtains that again, like I wasn't privy to until uh, I got into the QI position and learned about the stuff that goes on behind the scenes. And there's a lot that goes on, there's a lot of moving gears, um, but it's, it's pretty neat to see and learn about. So we get into uh, performance here. Regardless of the performance, when, when we look at things, was it, was it worse than the average provider in our system or was it about the same? So Chief Burns hit uh, a lot of that stuff. Um, it may be a problem, but everybody may be doing it. So we have to take a look at um, you know, educating, re-educating, communicating, re-communicating uh, certain things when, when we notice uh, deficiencies in our, our performance metrics. So here you'll see some examples of things that uh, began from the, the QI office. Um, <clears throat> a lot of medical protocols uh, originate from uh, quality improvement across the state of Maryland. Um, <clears throat> a couple years ago, we put the orange stickers, the 12 lead stickers, and the aspirin because we noted a decrease in our performance across the system. Uh, so we put these orange stickers on the life packs and we actually saw a, uh, a notable increase in uh, compliance with aspirin administration on chest pain calls uh, within a period of time. I believe it was like two or three months uh, we got an uh, increase in compliance, which was, which was pretty awesome. And then we're, all the paramedics out there are familiar with the stickers that are on the uh, air track. Um, <clears throat> again, just a, a checklist, a step-by-step -step guide uh, to increase our, our successfulness when we're, when we're innovat innovating a patient. So, believe it or not, quality improvement is a science. We have seen the PDCA uh, cycle before. Um, it's a tool for evaluating improvement. Uh, we plan, we do, we check, and then we act, and then we, we constantly reevaluate. So, uh, QI uses a scientific approach to analyzing and improving performance. So, we have to take a look at what performance is important. A lot of that stuff can be... Um, kind of guided or dictated by uh, national metrics, uh, state metrics, and then there's things that, that we want to govern and we want to take a look at um, that, that were, is important to us and showing value for, for what you guys do out there day in and day out. We also want to look at the biggest area or room for improvement, essentially where, where do we focus our efforts. Uh, everybody's busy, everybody's time is very valuable, so as Chief Burns said, we, we have to triage our time and figure out what's, what's worth going after, what can we wait for, and uh, you know, what may, we may never get to. Um, <clears throat> when looking at things and, and looking at a system, systemic approach to improvement, what is our current performance? You know, where are we and where do we want to go? What do we want to see get better? And what do, we want to, what do we expect to see from an intervention? So we, we note a problem, we develop a plan, uh, we kind of communicate the intervention, and then what do we expect to see, you know, see uh, from that in terms of, of numbers? So this is just kind of an example. It's kind of like 
kind of nerdy stuff, if I'm being honest with you. But anything we do in quality improvement is measured over a period of time. So uh, we look at performance measured over a period of time. Um, so this is, is just a, a visualization, if you will. You can see in the middle of the chart there, there was a QI intervention. Our performance was kind of scattered um, <clears throat> throughout the, the first 24 months there. We uh, instituted a QI intervention, and we got um, a lot more consistent performance um, out of the system as a whole. So um, not really going to get into detail what that is, but just so you can kind of see the, the science behind uh, what you do. So the initiatives, where do they derive from? Where do they come from? As Chief Burns touched upon, uh, we see things in uh, First Watch. Uh, something that we kind of mon I monitor over time, so I, I read the reports. I'm not so much concerned on how that provider performed that day, but I'm looking for trends over the course of time. Uh, so one of the things that I've, I've seen throughout my tenure here is uh, Narcan still being administered during cardiac arrest. Uh, we've put out a CPG, and we continue to educate providers on um, kind of holding off on, on Narcan uh, during a cardiac arrest. There's a time and a place for it, but um, so that's kind of just an example of a trend that, uh, that I've noticed. Um, <clears throat> we're able to run, run reports out of uh, image trend or what you guys know as, as eMeds. So on the, the back end, there's the ability to uh, extract the data and run reports, which is pretty cool. One of the things that I do on a pretty regular basis uh, is interact with a lot of stakeholders and partners. Um, so again, um, Ben is the liaison, Chief uh, Kaufman is the liaison uh, with a lot of the hospital administration. So I'm on a lot of those calls and I also touch base with uh, nurse managers that oversee ACS and STEMI information, uh, stroke information, so a lot of meetings nonetheless. Um, <clears throat> interact with, with our billing agency if they have questions. Um, and then other government agencies that, that may have questions about fire rescue uh, or whatnot. One of the things that I directly oversee is our, our process owners. Some of you may have heard about it. Some of you may, have, may not have. Um, so what is a process owner? A process owner is uh, uh, somebody from the streets. So today we have firefighter paramedic Cook here from Station 8. Thank you for, thank you for being here. No problem. Um, he was asked a couple months ago to uh, look at the data and uh, kind of provide some oversight and some feedback um, in, in the domain of the ALS to BLS downgrade report. So it was just providing a street-level uh, street view um, by reading reports um, and noting, um, just, just trying to get, I guess, his, his feet wet more or less on what's going on out there. Um, so, yeah, let's talk a little bit about first first pass yeah so it's a it's a module within the first watch system <clears throat> and what it does is uh, it it takes that stream of data and it peels off the um, the ALS to BLS downgrades anytime an ALS to BLS downgrade happens and it looks at the report of the transporting BLS unit and it runs tests on it so it looks at the primary impression it looks at the primary symptom it looks at the vitals it looks at the uh, pain scale uh, a bunch of different things uh, and it and it runs tests, and if it meets the tests and everything's okay, right, so there was the primary impression wasn't crazy, the vitals weren't way out of whack, uh, if all those things are okay, it pushes that report on through and, and Josh never sees it. If any one of those tests comes up where, you know, maybe the primary impression was that the patient was unconscious or the blood pressure was 200 over 100, uh, it flags it for him to review man manually. Uh, and then he goes in and he looks at the, the report and reads the narrative. Um, he also can open up the downgrade checklist um, or any other reports associated with it. And he makes a judgment based on his own experience as a field-level provider and says, all right, yeah, that, that was okay. I can see why they did that based on their documentation. Or, no, it's still questionable. And the important part of what he's doing there is data collection, right? So not only do we have – it would be very easy for me to pull the data, um, but it, it wouldn't have that human interaction of him with his experience looking at it and say, no, that's reasonable, and, and move it on through. It would, uh, he's adding that deliberate, defensible, communicated aspect of what, the, what their decision was, and he's looking to see that the process was followed. Um, 
and then from there, so so he, he spent a couple months not only uh, doing the current work that's happening because we're doing 20 to 30 downgrades a day um, and only a certain portion of those are being flagged but now he's starting to work back to give us a, a foundation of data with which we can use or upon which we can we can make some assumptions right so now we can start to look and see all right where are we falling down on these ALS to BLS downgrade decisions. When a downgrade is questionable, is it because the vital signs, you know, I can I, I can look very easily at the data that he's collected and and put his human uh, perspective into and and I can see, all right, where are the biggest problems and that's where we can focus our improvement efforts. Um, and then he can also look at them being a field level provider and have the insight of what's going on on the street, right? Nick and I work in offices and I'm fortunate enough to have a window, but he can't even see outside. So um, having Josh there and the other processors, all our process owners, all the other process owners are field level paramedics who are interacting with patients on a daily basis and that was done by design so that we we have somebody who is still out there in the streets uh, dealing with patients and bringing that perspective awesome. Josh anything you'd like to add oh uh, chief you basically said all of about my job um, it definitely has uh, offered me an opportunity to see how things are going outside of station 8 and the 3rd battalion basically and uh, get me more in touch with how we can improve systems moving forward as a junior member in the department uh, with only about five years on the job uh, and where we can move things to continue providing the care that we do and the level of care that we do um, and in turn uh, improve my own personal uh, care abilities in the field right uh, one Jim you have a question sure uh, so this would be for Josh right so uh, you got to peek behind the curtain right so now you're behind the curtain yes uh, what did what do you, did you see or what have you seen that hmm, you didn't realize it existed before in our system? I'm not talking about, you know, a case, but just in general, like, hey, now um, I'm part of this process, what, what did you learn that's like, wow, I didn't expect? Across yeah, there's, uh, there's trends across the department, um, depending on battalion, depending on it being a volunteer unit or a career unit, uh, the propensity for a downgrade with a volunteer unit is higher so from what we career career als provider to a downgrading to a volunteer bls unit. yes and it, it, there is a, a propensity for that to happen and there's definitely way more volunteer bls reports in my inbox quote unquote than career um, bls units um, and then there are trends within shifts battalions areas i won't even say battalion sometimes um, and you start to see where maybe there is a lack of uh, knowledge or maybe a misunderstanding of knowledge that has been put out. And that's then in turn gone to Matt Wagner and Chief Burns to create the five minute drills, the, you know, to hammer down on some things. The, the big one lately is albuterol. That was a trend that we were seeing across and in my little bit of time between, that was April when I started till now, I saw ones then and they'd already been tracking it, so it was something to move forward and improve. So for folks in the field, there was a protocol change uh, last year where BLS providers could give nebulized albuterol. So what we saw was the uh, BLS provider getting there, uh, administering uh, the albuterol nebulizer and putting the ALS unit in service. Uh, we saw that trend for, for a good year, so we wanted to get the word out that um, <clears throat> that's – the, the intent behind that protocol was to get the, the albuterol into the patient uh, faster, but that doesn't negate the, the need for, for ALS. There still needs to be an ALS assessment, and those things still need to, to carry along uh, with each other. So that was something that Josh had pointed out to us. And with the whole ALS to BLS downgrade process, uh, I, I think that's going to be a, a push in the near future to do some improvement from a bunch of different uh, a bunch of different avenues. We see a lot of variability in how people execute that process or whether they even execute the process. The process is defined by Fire Chief's General Order. Um, uh, it was developed uh, very thoughtfully with uh, some a, a bunch of analysis. Uh, we know that if you follow the process, you're less likely to have a, a questionable downgrade. 
um, and the process works. Uh, it does not bind folks one way or the other uh, in terms of transporting or not transporting. It's, it's designed to guide folks in one, in, in, and help them to make a good decision. Um, you know, we've, we recently did a bunch of analysis. Like I said, we're bringing Josh on, having him read all these reports. Uh, I've been doing a bunch of analysis. Uh, we know that, that the AFRAs are significantly more likely to, or have a, a significantly higher rate of downgrade than chase cars and transport ALS units. Um, and it also seems to be, so I believe it was 2.4 times more likely. If it, it, so uh, with the AFRA and the chase car, the ALS provider is not bound to transport when they downgrade, right? So they're gonna go in service with, uh, with an ALS transport unit, they're going to the hospital one way or the other, right? So if we look at, uh, they were, uh, an ALS transport unit was dispatched on an ALS call, but they said that they only gave BLS care during transport, right? Uh, it's, the downgrade is 2.4 times more likely to happen if, if the paramedic doesn't go, have to go to the hospital, right? So does, I have a question with that. So does all of that happen solely from the EMEDS report, or does it happen from our unit and incident? Re do you pull data from there as well? Mm, we pull data from, from RMS, but not specifically. It's more like CAD data that comes sort of through records management. So it's all, right, so it was dispatched as ALS. Uh, the level of care during transport was BLS. Um, there was an ALS unit on the scene more than, you know, what, what, what ALS unit was on the scene longest, uh, how long were they there, right? So it sort of excludes the, the wave-offs, um, stuff like that. So there, there is some assumptions in that analysis, um, but the take-home point is that, that there are disparities in the downgrade, uh, the rate of downgrade or the downgrade frequency based on how the paramedic gets there, right? And all things being equal with a, the, the process, ALS BLS downgrade process, if it were functioning correctly and being used by everyone, it's designed to create consistency. It's de designed to create a consistent patient experience because the patient doesn't care whether you got there on an engine or no. a chase car or on a, their medical needs don't change based on that. So uh, to find this incredible disparity in, in the treatment that the patient gets based on how the, the paramedic got there, leads us to believe that we have some work to do. So using that topic, it seems to me that a year or so ago, there was, this was, right, the hot topic, the downgrades. Mm -hmm. So then we came out with, the, the, I think, the checklist. Yes. How long, so we identified that problem, we came up with a checklist, we educated people on the proper way to do that. What kind of level of improvement do we see after doing that? Like, so are the, do the cases 50% better? Or are they 90% better? So I, I, I think the first question and the first hill we have to climb is, is the process even being used? Um, I think our culture as an organization leaves wiggle room as to whether or not people even do it. And I have <clears throat> a reasonable belief that... Um, that it's not being done in at least 50% of the cases, right? 50% of the, the only way I have to know that the process was being followed is if the documentation is there. Mm -hmm. It's not about the documentation, it's about following the process. Did you have that conversation? Did the ALS provider have that conversation with the BLS provider? Was the checklist used, right? So we, we have to use the presence of the checklist or two, two reports as a surrogate for whether or not the process was followed. That being said, that documentation is only complete 50% of the time, and it varies widely by unit uh, and by shift and by individual. Some people are doing it all the time. Some people are doing it not at all. So I can't make a conclusion about how well the process improved the, the rate of questionable downgrades if only 50% of the people are using the process. So the first step is going to be getting folks to use the process. And then we can see, then we can start to see, all right, now that people are using the process, I can compare to when the process wasn't in place. And then I can also see where in the process, or where in the decision making is, are we falling down and what needs to be improved. Uh, all of that is, is wrapped up in this huge 
uh, effort that we're probably going to undertake fairly soon. And, and step one is going to be getting people to follow the process. And is it that way with all of our topics? And we talked about albuterol. Is it kind of the same thing? We've identified, hey, there might be a deficiency in this area. Let's try to educate people on albuterol now that, and I know it's only been a couple of weeks, are we seeing an, an improvement from your office or the stance yeah, or, or so whomever makes that decision? I, I don't know yeah, who it is. Yeah, we, 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 I don't have, I have not pulled any numbers. Sometimes that, that really granular data analysis takes some time. I just haven't had time to pull numbers, but Josh can tell us anecdotally what he's seeing. Have you seen a change since yes. that? And yes. Let's use Alibuter, all so, we're talking about it. So, like I said, between April and we'll say uh, a week and a half ago when the CPG came out, um, I think I had roughly 10 pop up in my ALS to BLS downgrade that were questionable or was not carried out appropriately. And they were referred up. Since that has come out, and I did them as of yesterday at about 1 o'clock in the afternoon, there haven't been any questionable albuterol issues or downgrades or incidents since that came out uh you know that that gives plenty of time for those to come into work read their email see it and start applying it to their own care yeah and it's I still th- early we yeah, might not have run a ton of calls exactly and um i think we'll we'll really start seeing that data in maybe a, a month to three months where we can actually be okay we have a substantial um data set to go off of so and that's unusually successful Right. That was, and sometimes the things that yeah. ruffle pe- people's feathers are the things that, you know, the best way to, to for to spread them. Right. We have a communications issue. We have message saturation, and and we try. We've we've taken a an approach. Uh, we call it a shotgun approach. Right. We try and send uh, small bits of information out via a wide range of media, uh, whether it's the podcast, whether it's targeted emails, whether it's the five minute drills, all these different things. Um, and we, we try and get it out in a, in a, uh, because people learn different ways. People hear about things different ways yeah. and, and we try and uh, get it out there. Fortunate. Uh, sometimes the things that ruffle people's feathers are, because the other way that, that word gets around the organization is at the lineup table. And we get, when, when we send a CPG in a five-minute drill, it tells people they can't downgrade patients who get albuterol anymore. And people start chirping to one another and say, Are you, can you believe those guys? And, and they're so, so unreasonable now. You know, yeah. the, the message gets out, right? Um, so I don't know. I wasn't in the firehouse when that came out. But... Um, I would imagine that, that there was a lot of discussion at the, the lineup tables and the message spread rather quickly, um, and, it, and it was an effective And plan. I think in the past where it was taking us six to eight months to, to train the organization, I mean, that's just, uh, uh, you know, it's excellent, right? I mean, less than a couple of weeks, and we're seeing a difference already. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So. One of the things I'd like to go back to real quick before we yeah, wrap this certainly. up is the why. The why behind why a uh, ALS to BLS downgrade is so important. Uh, something that I learned uh, is how many times uh, reports get uh, sequestered, if you will, from family members, from lawyers, and how many subpoenas we receive in the course of a month. So, you know, what what a downgrade is is essentially kind of a CY, another a tool to to kind of CYA. Right? If I'm a paramedic and I came and I did an assessment and I just walk away, there's no documentation. And that's what's going to either fall or stand up in, in the court of law. So I think that's, that's really important to understand. I don't know how many people out there have been uh, uh, sequestered to court, but it's a, a scary feeling. And it's definitely a scary feeling when you don't have any paperwork outside of a, um, a, 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 fire, poorly a, written a, report. a fire app narrative yeah. you know, that you may or may not have written. So um, I just wanted to kind of touch upon the why behind you know, some of those things. I think uh, that, that's really important. And a lot of, we, you know, over the, the number of years that I've been involved in quality improvement and quality assurance in this county, a, a majority of the really adverse patient outcomes that we've seen have involved um, ALS to BLS downgrades. It's a very big opportunity for failure, and and we've had some very significant uh, issues where where 
where the paramedics saw a patient, it was downgraded to BLS, and then there was something bad happened on the on the other end of that. Um, and sometimes the the BLS crew had no information, right? You know, they, they sort of they pulled up with and they said, just get your cut, and they slammed a the patient on it and took off, didn't give the, the BLS right. So now the patient, now the BLS crew's left the patient in may or may not be in cardiac arrest, no information about the patient or what's been going on. And that whole process is designed to not only make sure that everybody knows what's going on, but to also provide a moment of pause for the paramedic who's about to downgrade a patient who may not be appropriate for it. Chief, you have a, a question before mm, we... No, that's okay. I Go did, ahead. but I don't. Okay. It's be good. Keep going. Go ahead. All right. So just wrapping up kind of the QI portion of this is uh, you are part of a, a complex system with multiple lines of authority and accountability. So um, things can kind of get kind of complicated kind of quick. And there's a lot of questions out there uh, from the company officer standpoint, from the provider standpoint, maybe even from a, a battalion chief standpoint. Uh, so I, I offer this is uh, when you're confused or something doesn't make sense to you, uh, seek to understand the why. You can reach out to, to myself or, or anybody in the EMS section and um, <clears throat> we'll be more than happy to answer questions for you. Uh, keeping up is, is definitely difficult. Things are changing, equipment is changing, protocols change all the time. Uh, so we, we understand that it, it is hard to, to keep up. Um, and it's the, this complexity often drives the why we do things that don't always make sense. So sometimes we implement change and the why is not always communicated. Um, and it's because we're so big and things are so complex and moving at a such pace that communication can be hard. And uh, Chief Burns uh, touched upon that. So. Lastly, MCFRS has a quality improvement officer, but the real quality improvement and performance management is done by each of you every day. Every time you excuse poor performance or shoddy customer service, you have managed quality. So take that back to your crews. Think about your own performance. I know sometimes uh, it's hard to make the right decision at 3.30 in the morning when you're with a patient and you necessarily don't want to upgrade, but uh, it's important. So from a quality management stance, I mean, from a company officer stance, I, I think we're doing a good job. We really are. Mm -hmm. You know, there are some isolated cases where there are hiccups, right? Mm -hmm. But uh, not my word, but hiccups. Is it, would you agree? Absolutely, yeah. So I, where's our, where do we need to improve? Where do we need to, uh, so I where think. Can, what can I take back to company two and go, Look, guys, let's let's think about this for a little while. Let's talk about this. Let's have this discussion tomorrow morning at the lineup table. Absolutely. Where do I? So I think going forward in the near near future, this ALS to BLS downgrade thing, it, it's going to be a thing. Um, I think knowing that process that's outlined in that fire chief's general order and, and ensuring as a company officer, you're responsible for that guy riding behind you. And if you don't see him pull aside the BLS crew and go through the checklist and have that time out and say, all right, this is what I'm seeing. Let's do the checklist, um, right? I, I think from the standpoint of the other folks, you know, your E3 person can be, when you go on an ALS call and the paramedics uh, assessing the patient, they can be pulling up that, you know, one of the things we've heard is the technology gets in the way and people don't, you know, it takes forever to pull the report up and then it takes forever to start the checklist, right? Maybe you make sure that that E3 guy's pulling that up so it's right there so that you're not waiting around uh, whether or not, the, to find out whether or not the paramedic's going because somebody's using the EPCR, right? It's not like it's going to be, um, it's going to be wasted effort. Uh, making sure the, the process is followed, and it's not even about you second-guessing your paramedic as to whether or not they're going to the hospital. Sometimes you know. Yeah, I and mean, that's a fine line, right? You right, but, but sometimes you know when it's obvious, but did they follow the process? Because the process, the checklist, all that is designed to give them a moment of pause. And if they go through that whole checklist and they go, uh, is your patient having chest pain? Yes. Right? Are, your, are the vital signs abnormal? Yes. Right? And they still choose to downgrade. You know, th that's a conversation we can have after the fact. Um, 
I think if you looked at the, as a captain, you looked at the checklist and saw that the patient failed like eight out of the 20 points or whatever it is, I think you might say something to them. But, you know, the more nuanced ones, as long as you see them going through the checklist and following the process, I think you've done your job, right? You've ensured that the process was followed. So I, I think that is a, a big area for improvement organization-wide. I think, um, you know, we're really good at being nice. Um, I think it's not tolerated for the most part, uh, you know, poor customer service or ho however you want to. I would hope it would. You, yeah, you, however you uh, phrase it. I, occasionally we see stuff come through in those surveys, but a lot of it is just perception, right? You know, people have no intention of being, you know, they're just taken the wrong way or somebody's having a bad day. Um, and then trying to consume all of the things that we know that, that we know we're sending a lot out, right? The medicine changes, the the science changes, uh, and trying to make sure that your folks are staying up with with all of that um, are probably my biggest things. All right, guys. Well, thank you. Uh, no more questions, Chief Davis. No. All right. <laughs> uh, thank you for bearing with us uh, a little longer than normal. Um, but really good uh, conversation, and that's really what this is about, you know, educating everybody. And truly what ends up happening is we take better care of the people here in the county. Um, so only thing I really have to remind everybody of is our next challenge in the street, August 16th. Uh, I believe we're going to do it from here, but it's going to be the telestaff people. Uh, get a little background about that. Um, how they do and why they do what they do. So until then, uh, thank you and be safe.